Hey everybody, it's Mrs. Marquez, and I'm here with Matilda by Roald Dahl. We will be reading chapters 20 and 21, and that will be the end of this book. So let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 20 is called The Third Miracle. <clears throat> the next day was Thursday, and that, as the whole of Miss Honey's class knew, was the day on which the headmistress would take charge of the first lesson after lunch. In the morning, Miss Honey said to them, one or two of you did not particularly enjoy the last occasion when the headmistress took the class, so let us all try to be especially careful and clever today. How are your ears, Eric, after your last encounter with Miss Trunchbull? She stretched them, Eric said. My mother says she's positive they're bigger than they were. And Rupert, Miss Honey said, I'm glad to see you didn't lose any of your hair after last Thursday. My head was jolly sore afterwards, Rupert said. And you, Nigel, Miss Honey said. Do please try not to be a smart aleck with the headmistress today. You were really quite cheeky on her last week. I hate her, Nigel said. Try not to make it so obvious, Miss Honey said. It doesn't pay. She's a very strong woman. She has muscles like steel ropes. I wish I was grown up, Nigel said. I'd knock her flat. I doubt you would, Miss Honey said. No one has ever gotten the better of her yet. What will she be testing us on this afternoon? A small girl asked. Almost certainly the three times table, Miss Honey said. That's what you were all meant to have learnt this past week. Make sure you know it. Lunch came and went. After lunch, the class reassembled. Miss Honey stood at one side of the room. They all sat silent, apprehensive, waiting. And then, like some giant of doom, the enormous trunch bull strode into the room in her green breeches and cotton smock. She went straight to her jug of water and lifted it up by the handle and peered inside. I am glad to see, she said, that there are no slimy creatures in my drinking water this time. If there had been, then something exceptionally unpleasant would have happened to every single member of this class. That includes you, Miss Honey. The class remained silent and very tense. They had learnt a bit about this tigress by now, and nobody was about to take any chances. Very well, boomed the trunch bowl. Let us see how well you know your three times table. Or, to put it another way, let's see how badly Miss Honey has taught you the three times table. The trunch bowl was standing in front of the class, legs apart, hands on hips, scowling at Miss Honey, who stood silent to one side. Matilda, sitting motionless at her desk in the second row, was watching things very closely. You, the trunch bowl shouted, pointing a finger at the size of a rolling pin at a boy called Wilfred. Wilfred was on the extreme right of the front row. Stand up, you, she shouted. Wilfred stood up. Recite the three times table backwards, the trunch bull barked. B -b -b backwards, stammered Wilfred. But, but I haven't learned it backwards. There you are, cried the trunch bull, triumphant. She's taught you nothing. Miss Honey, why have you taught them absolutely nothing all this past week? That is not true, headmistress, Miss Honey said. They've all learnt their tre three times tables, but I see no point in teaching it to them backwards. There's little point in teaching anything backwards. The whole object of life, headmistress, is to go forwards. I venture to ask whether even you, for example, can spell a simple word like wrong backwards straight away. I very much doubt it. Don't you get impertinent with me, Miss Honey, the trunch bull snapped. Then she turned back to the unfortunate Wilfred. Very well, boy, she said. Answer me this. I have seven apples, seven oranges, and seven bananas. How many pieces of fruit have I got all together? Hurry up, get on with it, give me the answer. That's adding up, Wilfred cried. That isn't the three times table. You blithering idiot, shouted the trunchbull. You festering gumboil, you fleet it and fungus. That is the three times table. You have three separate lots of fruit and each lot has seven pieces. Three sevens are 21. Can't you see that, you stagnant cesspool? I'll give you one more chance. I have eight coconuts, eight monkey nuts, and eight li nutty little idiots like you. How many nuts do I have all together? Answer me quickly. Poor Wilfred was properly flustered. Wait, he cried. Please wait. I've got to add up eight coconuts and eight monkey nuts. He started counting on his fingers. You bursting blister, yelled the trunchbull. You moth-eaten maggot, that is not adding up. 
This is multiplication. The answer is three eights. Or is it eight threes? What is the difference between three eights and eight threes? Tell me that, you mangled little wurzel, and look sharp about it. But now Wilford was far too frightened and bewildered even to speak. In two strides, the trunchbull was beside him, and by some amazing gymnastic trick, it may have been judo or karate, she flipped the back of Wilfred's legs with one of her feet so that the boy shot up off the ground and turned a somersault in the air. But halfway through the somersault, she caught him by an ankle and held him dangling upside down like a plucked chicken in a shop window. Eight threes, the trunchbull shouted, swinging Wilfred from side to side by the ankle. Eight threes is the same as three eights, and three eights are twenty-four. Repeat that. At exactly that moment, Nigel, at the other end of the room, jumped to his feet and started pointing excitedly at the blackboard and screaming, The chalk! The chalk! Look at the chalk! It's moving all on its own! Poor Wilfred. So hysterical and shrill was Nigel's scream that everyone in the place, including the trunchbull, looked up at the blackboard, and there, Surely enough, a brand new piece of chalk was hovering near the gray-black writing surface of the blackboard. It's writing something, screamed Nigel. The chalk is writing something. And indeed it was. Agatha. What the blazes is this? yelled the trunchbull. It had shaken her to see her own first name being written like that by an invisible hand. She dropped Wilford on the floor. Then she yelled at nobody in particular. Who's doing this? Who's writing it? The chalk continued to write. Agatha, this is Magnus. This is Magnus. Everyone in the place heard the gasp that came from the trunchbull's throat. No, she cried. It can't be. It can't be Magnus. It is Magnus, and you'd better believe it. Miss Honey, at the side of the room, glanced swiftly at Matilda. The child was sitting very straight at her desk, her head held high, the mouth compressed, the eyes glittering like stars. Agatha, give Jenny my house. For some reason, everyone now looked at, oh, I'm sorry, Agatha, give my Jenny back her house. For some reason, everyone now looked at the trunchbull. The woman's face had turned white as snow, and her mouth was opening and shutting like a halibut out of water, and giving it a series of strangled gasps. Give my Jenny her wages. Give my Jenny the house. Then get out of here. If you don't, I will come and get you. I will come and get you like you got me. I am watching you, Agatha. The chalk stopped writing. It hovered for a few moments. Then suddenly it dropped to the floor with a tinkle and broke in two. Wilfred, who had managed to resume his seat in the front row, screamed, Miss Trunchbull has fallen down! Miss Trunchbull is on the floor! This was the most sensational bit of news of all, and the entire class jumped out of their seats to have a really good look. And there she was. The huge figure of the headmistress stretched full length on her back across the floor out for the count. Miss Honey ran forward and knelt beside the prostrate giant. She's fainted, she cried. She's out cold. Someone go and fetch the matron at once. Three children ran out of the room. Nigel, always ready for action, leapt up and seized the big jug of water. My father says cold water is the best way to wake up someone who's fainted, he said. And with that, he tipped the entire contents of the jug over the trunchbull's head. No one, not even Miss Honey, protested. As for Matilda, she continued to sit motionless at her desk. She was feeling curiously elated. She felt as though she had touched something that was not quite of this world, the highest point of the heavens, the farthest star. She had felt most wonderfully the power surging up behind her eyes, gushing like a warm fluid inside her skull, and her eyes had become scorching hot, hotter than ever before, and things had come bursting out of her eye sockets, and then the piece of chalk had lifted itself up and begun to write. It seemed as though she had hardly done anything. It had all been so simple. The school matron, followed by five teachers, three women and two men, came rushing into the room. 
By golly, someone's floored her at last, cried one of the men, grinning. Congratulations, Miss Honey. Who threw the water over her? asked the matron. I did, Nigel said proudly. Good for you, another teacher said. Shall we get some more? Stop that, the matron said. We must carry her up to the sick room. It took all five teachers and the matron to lift the enormous woman and stagger with her out of the room. Miss Honey said to the class, I think you'd all better go outside to the playground and amuse yourselves until the next lesson. Then she turned and walked over to the blackboard and carefully wiped out all of the chalk writing. The children began filing out of the classroom. Matilda started to go with them, but as she passed Miss Honey, she paused, and her twinkling eyes met the teacher's eyes, and Miss Honey ran forward and gave the tiny child a great big hug and a kiss. Chapter 21 is called A New Home. Later that day, the news began to spread that the headmistress had recovered from her fainting fit, and had then marched out of the school tight-lipped and white in the face. The next morning she did not turn up at school. At lunchtime, Mr. Trilby, the deputy head, telephoned her house to inquire if she was feeling unwell. There was no answer to the phone. When school was over, Mr. Trilby decided to investigate further, so he walked to the house where Miss Trunksville lived on the edge of the village, the lovely, small, red-brick Georgian building known as the Red House, tucked away in the woods behind the hills. He rang the bell. No answer. He knocked loudly. No answer. He called out, Is anybody at home? No answer. He tried the door, and to his surprise, found it unlocked. He went in. The house was silent, and there was no one in it, and yet all of the furniture was still in place. Mr. Trilby went upstairs to the main bedroom. Here also everything seemed to be normal, until he started opening drawers and looking into cupboards. There were no clothes or underclothes or shoes anywhere. They had all gone. She'd done a bunk, Mr. Trilby said to himself, and he went away to inform the school governors that the headmistress had apparently vanished. On the second morning, Miss Honey received by registered post a letter from a firm of local solicitors informing her that the last will and testament of her late father, Dr. Honey, had suddenly and mysteriously turned up. This document revealed that ever since her father's death, Miss Honey had in fact been the rightful owner of a property on the edge of the village known as the Red House, which until recently had been occupied by Miss Agatha Trunchbull. The will also showed that her father's lifetime savings, which fortunately were still safely in the bank, had also been left for her. The solicitor's letter added that if Miss Honey would kindly call into the office as soon as possible, then the property and the money could be transferred into her name very rapidly. Miss Honey did just that, and within a couple of weeks, she had moved into the Red House, the very place in which she had been brought up and where luckily all of the family furniture and pictures were still around. From then on, Matilda was a welcome visitor to the Red House every single evening after school, and the very close friendship began to develop between the teacher and the small child. Back at school, great changes were also taking place. As soon as it became clear that Miss Trunchbull had completely disappeared from the scene, the excellent Mr. Trilby was appointed head teacher in her place, and very soon after that, Matilda was moved up into the top form, where Miss Plimsoll quickly discovered that this amazing child was every bit as bright as Miss Honey had said. One evening, a few weeks later, Matilda was having tea with Miss Honey in the kitchen of the Red House after school, as they always did, when Matilda said suddenly, Something strange has happened to me, Miss Honey. Tell me about it, Miss Honey said. This morning, Matilda said, just for fun, I tried to push something over with my eyes, and I couldn't do it. Nothing moved. I didn't even feel the hotness building up behind my eyeballs. The power had gone. I think I've lost it completely. Miss Honey carefully buttered a slice of brown bread and put a little strawberry jam on it. I've been expecting something like that to happen, she said. You have? Why? Matilda asked. Well, Miss Honey said, it's only a guess, but here's what I think. While you were in my class, you had nothing to do, nothing to make you struggle. Your fairly enormous brain was going crazy with frustration. It was bubbling and boiling away like mad inside your head. There was tremendous energy bottled up in there with nowhere to go, and somehow or other you were able to shoot that energy out through your eyes and make objects move. But now things are different. You are in top form, competing against children more than twice your age, and all that mental energy is being used up in class. Your brain is in for the first time having to struggle and strive and keep really busy, which is great. The, that's only a theory, mind you, and it may be a silly one, but I don't think it's far off the mark. I'm glad it's happened, Matilda said. I wouldn't want to go through life as a miracle worker. 
You've done enough, Miss Honey said. I can still hardly believe you made all that happen for me. Matilda, who was perched on a tall stool at the kitchen table, ate her bread and jam slowly. She did so love these afternoons with Miss Honey. She felt completely comfortable in her presence, and the two of them talked to each other more or less as equals. Did you know, Matilda said suddenly, that the heart of a mouse beats at a rate of 650 times a second? I did not, Miss Honey said, smiling. How absolutely fascinating. Where did you read that? In a book from the library, Matilda said. And that means it must go so fast you can't even hear the separate beats. It must just sound like a buzz. It must, Miss Honey said. And how fast do you think a hedgehog heart beats? Matilda asked. Tell me, Miss Honey said, smiling again. It's not as fast as a mouse, Matilda said. It's 300 times a minute. But even so, you wouldn't have thought it went as fast as that in a creature that moves so slowly, would you, Miss Honey? I certainly wouldn't, Miss Honey said. Tell me one more. A horse, Matilda said. That's really slow. It's only 40 times a minute. This child, Miss Honey told herself, seems to be interested in everything. When one is with her, it is impossible to be bored. I love it. The two of them stayed sitting and talking in the kitchen for an hour or so longer, and then, at about six o'clock, Matilda said good night and set out to walk home to her parents' house, which was about an eight-minute journey away. When she arrived at her own gate, she saw a large black Mercedes motor car packed outside. There's them having tea. She didn't take too much notice of that. There were often strange cars parked outside her father's place, but when she entered the house, she was confronted by a scene of utter chaos. Her mother and father were both in the hall, frantically stuffing clothing and various objects into suitcases. What on earth is going on? She cried. What's happened, Daddy? We're off, Mr. Wormwood said, not looking up. We're leaving for the airport in half an hour, so you'd better get packed. Your brother's upstairs all ready to, get to go. Get a move on, girl. Get going. Off? Matilda cried. Where to? Spain, the father said. It's a better climate than this lousy country. Spain, Matilda cried. I don't want to go to Spain. I love it here, and I love my school. Just do as you're told and stop arguing, the father snapped. I've got enough troubles without messing about with you. But Daddy, Matilda began. Shut up, the father shouted. We're leaving in 30 minutes. I'm not missing that plane. But how long for, Daddy, Matilda cried. When are we coming back? We aren't, the father said. Now beat it. I'm busy. Matilda turned away from him and walked out through the open front door. As soon as she was on the road, she began to run. She headed straight back towards Miss Honey's house, and she reached it in less than four minutes. She flew up the drive, and suddenly she saw Miss Honey in the front garden, standing in the middle of a bed of roses doing something with a pair of clippers. Miss Honey had heard the sound of Matilda's feet racing over the gravel, and now she straightened up and turned and stepped out of the rose bed as the child came running up. My, my, she said. What in the world is the matter? Matilda stood before her, panting, out of breath, her small face flushed crimson all over. They're leaving, she cried. They've all got mad and they're filling their suitcases and they're leaving for Spain in about 30 minutes. Who is? Miss Honey asked quietly. Mummy and Daddy and my brother Mike and they said I've got to go with them. You mean for a holiday? Miss Honey asked. Forever, Matilda cried. Daddy says we are never coming back. There was a brief silence. Then Miss Honey said, Actually, I'm not very surprised. You mean you knew they were going? Matilda cried. Why didn't you tell me? No, darling, Miss Honey said. I did not know they were going, but the news still doesn't surprise me. Why? Matilda cried. Please tell me why. She was still out of breath from the running and from the shock of it all. Because your father, Miss Honey said, is in with a bunch of crooks. Everyone in the village knows that. My guess is that he's a receiver of stolen cars from all over the country. He's in it deep. Matilda stared at her, open mouthed. Miss Honey went on. People brought stolen cars to your father's workshop where he changed the number plates and resprayed the bodies a different color and all the rest of it. And now somebody's probably tipped him off that the police are onto him and he's doing what they all do, running off to Spain where they can't get him. He'll have to be sending his money out there for years, all ready and waiting for him to arrive. 
They were standing on the lawn in front of the lovely red brick house with its weathered old red tiles and its tall chimneys, and Miss Honey still had the pair of garden clippers in one hand. It was a warm golden evening, and a blackbird was singing somewhere nearby. I don't want to go with them, Matilda shouted suddenly. I won't go with them. I'm afraid you must, Miss Honey said. I want to live here with you, Matilda cried. Please let me live here with you. I only wish you could, Miss Honey said, but I'm afraid it's not possible. You cannot leave your parents just because you want to. They have a right to take you with them. But what if they agreed, Matilda cried eagerly. What if they said, yes, I could stay with you? Would you let me stay with you then? Miss Honey said softly, yes, that would be heaven. Well, I think they might, Matilda cried. I honestly think they might. They don't actually care a tuppence about me. Not so fast, Miss Honey said. We've got to be fast, Matilda cried. They're leaving any moment. Come on, she shouted, grasping Miss Honey's hand. Please come with me and ask them. But we'll have to hurry. We'll have to run. The next moment, the two of them were running down the drive together, and then out the road, and Matilda was ahead, pulling Miss Honey after her by the wrist, and it was a wild and wonderful dash. They made along the country lane and through the village to the house where Matilda's parents lived. The big black Mercedes was still outside, and now its boot and all its doors were open, and Mr. and Mr. Mrs. Wormwood and the brother were scurrying around it like ants, piling in the suitcases as Matilda and Miss Honey came dashing up. Daddy and Mummy, Matilda bursted out, gasping for breath. I don't want to go with you. I want to stay here and live with Miss Honey, and she says that I can, but only if you give me permission. Please say yes. Go on, Daddy. Say yes. Say yes, Mummy. The father turned and looked at Miss Honey. You're that teacher woman who once came here to see me, aren't you? He said. Then he went back to stowing the suitcases into the car. His wife said to him, This one will have to go in the back seat. There's no more room in the boot. I would love to have Matilda, Miss Honey said. I would look after her with loving care, Mr. Wormwood, and I would pay for everything. She wouldn't cost you a penny. But it's not my idea. It was Matilda's, and I will not agree to take her without your full and willing consent. Come on, Harry, the mother said, pushing his suitcase into the back seat. Why don't we let her go if that's what she wants? It'll be one less to look after. I'm in a hurry, the father said. I've got a plane to catch. If she wants to stay, let her stay. It's fine with me. Matilda leapt into Miss Honey's arms and hugged her, and Miss Honey hugged her back. And then the mother and father and brother were inside the car, and the car was pulling away with the tires screaming. The brother gave a wave through the rear window, but the other two didn't even look back. Miss Honey was still hugging the tiny curl in her arms, and neither of them said a word as they stood there, watching the big black car tearing around the corner at the end of the road, and disappearing forever into the distance. And that is the end of Matilda. There is a Matilda movie that your parents might or may not, depending on how they feel about it, let you watch now that we've finished the story. But the public library also always has Matilda in the children's section if you'd ever like to read it again. Um, we will be starting The Tale of Despero tomorrow.